schools and technology supported learning. How about that? Thank you very much. Very good impromptu uh, introduction. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, Thank you very much, everyone, for coming, because I've looked along the programme in this slot and I realise I'm competing with virtual wi midwifery, which I think was the real draw in this slot. So I'm very, very grateful that you're here, um, and which means that uh, you must find the topic interesting, and I hope I can, I can live up to that. For those of you who don't know Bechter, and there may be some of you, um, we are, in, e in effect, the, um, the, the lead agency for technology in education, focusing predominantly on the schools and FE sectors, working in the FE sector with um, our partner agency, JISC, um, but also having a coordinating role in terms, if, if you like, of general education strategy around technology. And that's called the Harnessing Technology Strategy, which is really a little bit of context for our work. That's a national strategy, um, and in fact, that's um, in effect sponsored by DS and what well, was DS, Biz, now Biz, and, and DCSF. And it has, well, all sorts of um, detail, but broadly five ambitions. Um, building the learner side, empowering learners, making them good at using technology, um, and ensuring that providers, schools, colleges, other providers are good at it as well, and including the workforce. Obviously very important, and this is really what this event is about, sharing, sharing practice, building practice, sharing innovation, leadership of innovation, leadership of technology. Very much underpinned by a really good, if you like, educational infrastructure. That's not just the kind of whole system stuff like a good broadband network, but also ensuring that um, colleges, schools, universities are enabled, and especially smaller institutions, because a lot of this they can't do for themselves to have a really good infrastructure that, that meets the needs of, of learners. But actually all towards, I guess, one core goal, although there will be other focuses as well, which is that word personalized learning. And obviously, if you went, came along to Richard's session this morning, personalized learning is a difficult term to define, but we have all got a sense of, of, of what it means. So that's the, the broad focus. Now, I'm talking about schools, we've got all sorts of um, data and information around FE as well, but with, I'm focusing on schools today, and there is a, a particular policy context for the work that Bechter takes forward in schools, and that's the um, 21st century schools, if you like, kind of policy, which is a white paper that was published earlier this year, which sets out the government's ambitions for, for schools. And um, it has some, some key themes, and I've picked out really key themes that, that, that relate to technology, and in fact, most of the key themes in, uh, or the key aims of 21st century schools uh, relate to technology in some way. Certainly excellent personalised education and development. So the question, which is a core question for all of us, is how can technology support improvements to learning, improvements to education more generally, and improvements to young people's uh, development in life and, and not just um, educationally. And so there's a whole if you like, set of areas there that I've listed, which represent activities that Bechter aims to support the sector in taking forward. And that does include making learning more engaging and more fun, uh, because that's certainly something that's, that's very important, especially in the context of, actually, in the UK, a relatively high number of young people who, certainly by the age of 16, 17, are out of any kind of formal education or even employment or training, and we want to make sure that they remain engaged. Early intervention and support, big theme of, of 21st century schools. Um, not sorting out problems when it's too late, but really understanding young people, their needs, um, you know, where they actually, you know, have problems, perhaps in literacy and numeracy, and diagnosing those, but also intervening and supporting in relation to those. So the diagnosis piece, um, using computer-based systems for that. Certainly, kind of really good recording and sharing of information um, in, in, in really effective ways and in real time in, in ways that are going to make a, make a difference. And another big theme is parents as partners. Very, very big thing. And it's um, absolutely true that uh, parents will make a real difference to young people's educational and other outcomes. That's absolutely true, and some people may argue, well, yeah, okay, so you get middle-class parents, uh, they're more likely to be involved, and they're, they're more likely to, you know, 
come out with these outcomes. But actually, there's, there's very, very strong studies that have shown that it doesn't matter what social group you come from and, and what educational background your parents come from, but actually, parental engagement and involvement in education, their kids' education, does actually make a difference and can predict better outcomes. So that's a very important theme for the department. Now, how can technology help? This is just some examples of the ways that Vector is um, uh, encouraging schools to use technology really as a means of getting that partnership working. Okay, albeit in you know, limited ways, but ways that will support you know, the genuine dialogue between teachers, for example, parents and learners about, okay, what's best for this child or what next or what's the problem here? Um, and I guess the kind of extension of virtual learning environments Vector sort of uses the term, commonly uses the term learning platforms, can be sort of learning and information platforms or even just information platforms, but platforms that enable information to be shared in a secure way with parents so that, for example, when they come to a parents' evening, they're much more knowledgeable about some of the progress and the issues and can have a much better dialogue with the school. So that's a kind of a, you know, kind of a quick tour around the policy context for a lot of the work that that Bechter does. Uh, what about research? Because I'm my lead on, the, on Bechter's research effort. We put a fair amount of resource into research uh, each year, and I'm kind of crossing my fingers that that will continue for a while. Certainly over about the last three or four years, we've made signif significant investments in research to really try and understand how technology can support achieving some of those outcomes. Um, we actually do pretty much three, three things. We want to know well, where are schools? So we do tracking and monitoring studies. We can do some interesting analyses of them. So which schools are you know, really good at using technology? Do they have any shared characteristics? Is it small schools, large schools, um, posh schools, you know, poor schools? Um, actually, posh schools, poor schools, big schools, small schools tend not to be factors in how good they are at using technology. Um, but we do some analysis like that. Um, more exploratory um, and just more, I guess, researchy. Uh, research, so usually with a kind of policy issue, and I'll give, give some examples of that in a moment. And then impact research, which is horribly difficult, really just desperately difficult to do. But we do think it is absolutely critical to get a sense where we see either uses of technology, innovations with technology, um, technology being used um, in very specific ways with very specific aims in mind, to assess whether or not there actually was a difference. Because if we can't pick up any real kind of improvement, either to the learning experience in the broader sense or to the outcomes for the learner, we do have to seriously ask, well, is this a good investment of teacher time, um, effort, and obviously the kind of technological enterprise that goes behind it? So it's a genuine question. But we, we don't do it from a policy perspective. I think we, we used to be one of these kind of agencies that did the, oh, public money being spent, let's check it's being spent really well. Um, technology is in, is in education, there's huge investment, it's not gonna go away, okay? We might be getting into more straightened times in the next few years, but huge investment is there and it will, it will continue, it may, may reduce a bit, who, who knows? Um, the question isn't about should we be using technology in education, it's how should we, and what are the most effective ways? And that, that, has, that has tended to shape our studies, our evaluation studies, and our, and our studies of impact. So some examples, and you'll see some of these coming up. Looking at narrowing the gap, which is narrowing the social class achievement gap, and, and what role technology can play in supporting low achieving and underachieving learners. Supporting needs, those not in education, employment, or training age sort of 16, 17, 18. Digital literacy and participation, curriculum and pedagogy, one-to-one -one personal mobile access, uh, and then the general kind of, is a load of impact studies. Actually, they're not things that we do every year. There's a, there's a kind of uh, probably about five years worth of impact work that we've been building, a kind of view of what is the impact of, 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 of different practice with technology. So that's a, a kind of indication of our research program. And then we do general surveys as well. Uh, and I've listed those because I will mention some of those studies. Uh, and some of them are kind of nearly reporting, and I'm giving you a bit of glimpse, a, a glimpse of what will be published. Some of them have already been published. I'll try if I remember to indicate um, where that's the case. 
Um, I know, for example, this week, I think, or last week, I think it was, the Narrowing the Gap Literature Review went up, and that's a very, very good literature review, which outlines some very interesting practice with technology um, and puts a nice framework around it um, for thinking about how, the, the, if you like, the school-based practices for helping support low and un un underachieving learners using technology. Okay, that's the intro, which was long enough. What do we actually know? Well, I'll start with children and young people. Um, and what I'll do is really give you a kind of a set of fairly kind of, well, not necessarily bold, but fairly bland statements and try and say a little bit more about them, about what we actually know, for, if you like, from different studies, sometimes in some cases from accumulated research. I think one thing that you would have heard a lot, and, it, uh, and actually it's a no-brainer, I don't really need to say it, is that young people are not all the same in relation to technology that comes very clearly out of the research. They actually represent themselves and position themselves differently in relation to technology. Not only are they different, possibly in their habits and behaviours, they actually think of themselves as different. You know? So there are you know, some kids that are thought of and might, may think of themselves, oh, I'm a really nerdy geeky, and another kid might, may say, actually, I don't like the idea of being addicted to the internet, you know, I'm more interesting. Um, you know, so there are very different ways that young people position themselves, and I think it's very important in a school response to that, and also, of course, a college and university response as kids move up the system, uh, to bear in mind that not everyone is, this, is the same. Uh, one thing that is certainly true, though, and I think this is a trend that, that, is, that is really interesting, bound to continue. Again, sounds pretty obvious. Kids are getting engaged with computers and the internet at younger ages, and I'll show you a, a chart in a moment. Um, you know, much younger ages than we thought before. So, you know, we're now talking five-year-olds being pretty competent in using the, the internet. Not all of them, but, you know, this is a, a, a real kind of reality. These are kids, you know, who haven't long been reading, <laughs> but they're using the internet, you know, actually in quite comfortable ways. So we're seeing more of that, and that, that's, that's a trend. It's actually a fairly recent trend, but something, obviously, to bear in mind. Uh, certainly, we're, we're, again, this is subtle. This is very, very subtle, but from lots of different research projects, we're seeing that, actually, we're getting signs of the, the real implica implications for how young people obviously manage their lives, and they are using technology to manage their lives, and we know that. Their, their social interactions, their leisure time, their entertainment, you know, you know, what they do in life, and technology mediates that to a very, very large degree with young people. And again, not to generalise, but that's been a big trend. But also their learning. So they, of course, actually will drag in habits. Now, they might not use Facebook all the time for learning. It's not about that. Um, they might use Facebook a bit to, you know, get the homework that they've left at school and make sure that they've done it. Um, but they will get into habits of interacting with people while they're learning, um, interacting with different resources while they're learning, and actually learning at home can, is becoming much more of that kind of very, very connected activity. Albeit, a lot of it will be just connected with the web and having lots of good information. But that is, that is shaping how they uh, are thinking about learning. And they're bringing, increasingly bringing those expectations in. I don't want to overplay the kids bringing the expectations from that kind of setting into education. They also, interestingly, have expectations that education won't be very interesting in terms of technology. So, <laughs> however, there is beginning to be a shift away from that. Okay, school's not that great at technology. Sometimes it is, and I've learned some useful skills, and there are some very good schools that are doing good things. Um, I'll tell you what proportion in a moment. And, and there's a chunk of schools that are kind of still trying to get there and still trying to make learning a little bit interesting. And there are curriculum issues, I think, in relation to the use of technology. So this was a quote about, um, in fact, the ICT curriculum. It could be about anything, really, but in this case, it was about using Excel. Well, you know, actually, I could have looked that up on a website. And they, you know, the, this was added to by, well, they took me, took five week, me five, five weeks to learn that at school when I could have just spent a bit of time online and learned it quite easily because there's lots of tools to teach you how to do that. Uh, so that's an expectation. Just an example, just one example. This is the, um, 
the really interesting, I like um, charts like this that have nice kind of interesting effects. This is uh, uh, tracking data of basically households with, with kids over time and those that have um, a, a, an internet connection. Um, and we had a very, a relatively low, well, it's just a bit more than 50% in 2000, 2007, uh, of those that had, um, if you like, the, the sort of five-year-olds in the house having access, and that's gone up quite steeply just in, in recent months. So that's, that's a really interesting, or, or recent, in recent years. We haven't got the 2009 yet, but we will do. So there's, a, there's an age five diff to 15, difference from age eight to 15, and it's the five-year-olds adopting, and that's, that's oh, five to seven-year-olds adopting, and that's a really interesting trend. What more can we say? Okay, so I'm sort of constructing this kind of picture of well-connected five-year-olds. It's not quite like that, but certainly it's true that um, well-connected young people is becoming much more a norm. If you certainly, if you look over a kind of five-year period, the trends are really quite amazing. They really are. And I don't think in any arena of life we've seen such rapid change as we have into, uh, compared to young people's adoption and use of, of technology. Um, so, there are gaps, though. Um, I'll show you the kind of access gaps in a moment in terms of, you know, actually there is still a social class issue here and we need to take it very seriously. Uh, but we also, of course, need to be critical of the kind of digital native concept. We've been working with Future Lab on um, digital literacy and participation, uh, and they've recently produced a very nice report which is about to be published on di digital literacy and participation and uh, have drawn together a bunch of um, literature and, and it's very clearly saying you know let's be cautious about this about this concept there are gaps there are s gaps in access and there's certainly gaps in young people's abilities to do things with technology that may well may be useful for for learning and that's really the the main but one of the things that uh, Future Lab um, and it's Ben Williamson and, and his team there have said is that actually um, there is a real divide in terms of, if you like, the kind of more interesting and what they might we might term 21st century skills with technology. So creativity, critical thinking, problem solving, using technology, or when you are solving a task with technology, do you actually engage in those ac in those activities? OECD is very clear. OECD has done an analysis of employment trends over time. We want young people to have productive, um, economically healthy lives because then we don't need to worry about them when they leave home. And so, um, actually, these skills are going to become increasingly important. And if you get a chance to have a look at some of the OECD analysis, if you like, of the kind of future skills, it's very, very interesting. So, um, two things, really. One is in relation to parents. Actually, they, they might qu be quite important. In fact, that in, in the um, University of Oxford research that we've commissioned, there were examples of parents being really quite important, uh, certainly in kind of early, earlier years, um, as in primary age group, uh, supporting, if you like, kind of learning with technology and providing a kind of mentor, mentoring. Uh, and, and, and that becomes part of providing a sort of secure and supportive learning environment at home. So there's some good examples of where parents were really helping kids, you know, to understand, find the right websites, know when it's not a great website, be critical about the information, um, supporting them in being creative and publishing whatever they wanted to do and, and so forth. So that, that does seem to be important. Again, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's possibly slightly counterintuitive because we think kids just get on with it. But actually, a lot of the time they can engage in really, you know, quite mundane activities online, some kids, and, and they, they, they need support and help. And something that comes out is that I don't want to come, o come over as overly critical on schools, because I think this is a developing area, and I think schools are trying really hard to keep up with technology-based changes and what they'll need for learning. But they're not necessarily doing that well at the moment in equipping children and young people uh, for, the, for, the, for the future and, and building the right kind of competencies and behaviours. And that's why we've uh, been working very closely with 
um, what's now QCDA, the Qualification and Curriculum Development Agency, um, alongside working with the Department for Children's Schools and Families in looking at the revisions to the primary curriculum, asking the question, okay, what kind of skills and competencies do we want an 11-year-old to come out with from primary school to go into secondary learning? We started from an assumption that actually secondary aged learning should really be about independent learning. Should actually be about independent learning. Not exclusively, but you would want to have the beginnings of good skills of independent learning. Now, this is something that when I taught in higher, higher education, we were saying was something we wanted higher education to do. It's, it's because of technology, I think it's coming down far more into secondary school environments. So this is a, a framework that's coming through on the Rose Review, which is the primary curriculum review. That's the sorts of, well, it's a framework, there's lots behind it. If you want to look at the, the document, just Google Rose Review and you'll see um, that there are proposals that are, that are out to consultation at the moment um, and likely, very likely to be included because they seem very popular with teachers and head teachers. This is the um, caution though, uh, in terms of young people. There are 6,641,225, but that was when it was published and there may be more or less since then, um, children at school, and that's primary school and secondary school, in England. This is England. And we've broken that down using some data from the family spending study, which is Ipsos Mori, into what the kind of household income will be for kids, you know, the households that those kids are in. And we've sort of done some fairly convenient uh, divisions. The income less than 15,912 is, is the baseline for, or, the, or the, the top level, if you like, for eligibility for free school meals. So it's, it's an important figure, around about £16,000 a year household income. You might not always be able to get free school meals with that, depends on your other circumstances, but that's, that's the uh, eligibility threshold. So we're interested in that group, and of that group, which is, you know, a reasonable chunk, uh, actually haven't got the percentages, which is interesting, but you might, might need to you might be able to work it out. Oh, but of that group, which is basically kids um, that are really in, pretty much in poverty, um, economic poverty, 39% don't have access to the internet at home. And I, I, don't, I don't think many of us think that of school-aged kids, you know, 40% don't have. Most think that most kids do. Of course, up at the kind of higher income, which is um, modest for a household income, but it will go up to all sorts, 27,196 and upwards, uh, then it's up at 93% with internet and then just 7% without. That's a very stark social divide, very, very stark, um, very interesting, very worrying. And the government is investing um, £300 million in a home access project, which is to equip, basically to equip parents with a, a single purchase credit card, which will buy them connectivity and a com computer for their kids if they're in, if they're in that lowest. So, that, so the government is trying to fill that gap at the moment. That's planned for later this year. Again, back to website, we'll give you more information about that. I know I'm so, sort of running short of time. Um, hopefully you have a bit of time for questions, but just a few things on what we can say about schools. Well, just, this is a chart I bring out a lot because I think it gives an indication of the, the range of practice in schools. This is secondary schools. And we asked teachers, and we asked a lot of teachers, um, how do they use technology? The question is, do they use technology, or how often do they use technology to de do these things with kids? Gather information, analyze information, be creative, solve problems, work with others. Interesting range, but very much chimes with kind of thinking around 21st century skills. Uh, and in 2008, for example, only 27% of, of of secondary teachers used technology to enable kids to work with each other, in effect, which is pretty damning, actually, although it's excellent progress on the year before, and we're, we're awaiting this year's figures. They could be better. But I think what it illustrates is, actually, there is a little way to go in terms of, in terms of practice. You wouldn't necessarily want every teacher to do all, all these things all, the, all of the time, but this is whether they do it some of the time, which is basically whether they, they do it at all. 
which is very interesting. Only 17% of secondary teachers do all five, or did all five in 2008. Higher in primary, actually. And as I say, we're awaiting an update on that. So there are some limitations in practice with technology, we know that. And just at the broad kind of uh, indicator, we, we look at school e-enablement. We collect a bunch of data from schools and we put it together and it's data on are they using technology across the curriculum? Are the skills there? Is the management there? Are, is the ICT resourcing there? Whole range of things that we put together. Um, and we've, we've recently done an analysis of it from this year's survey. Around about 35% of secondary schools, despite, if you like, a bit of a lag in practice, because they're great at other stuff, managing and pro providing technology, uh, are what we would call e-enabled. Um, the e-mature is a term that's sometimes used. Uh, we've got a kind of low hurdle version of that. Um, secondary school, sorry, primary schools, about a third. There is a, a, a bit of a margin of error here. You might think that primary schools have got worse. We don't think they have because of the margin of error, but they probably haven't got that much better, uh, is the conclusion we make. I'll go skip through this very quickly. Um, this tells us a range of factors in whether schools are good at that previous measure, e-enablement. E we were quite reassured that actually using Vector's self-review framework, SRF, is, is a factor. Hurrah, Vector's um, possibly making a difference, uh, just possibly. And then there's other, other things. CPD comes out very, very strong on whether or not the practice is in place. The, obviously, the technology, the management, and so forth is working well. So CPD, I think, is a main kind of theme there in, in terms of whether or not schools are getting there. Finally, um, stuff, some stuff on impact. Um, uh, well, impact of technology, and again, if, uh, uh, Richard this morning said, well, it's, it's like saying, would you ask what's the impact of books Well, on learning? Well, you wouldn't, because it depends what's in the book and depends how the book's being used and, and so forth. We do pick up some general uh, impact, but we don't say what's the impact of technology. We generally say what's the impact of technology, this sort of technology or using technology in, in this way. Having said that, these are pretty broad brush, some of these. Um, assessment related project work. Lo and behold, having good access to the internet helps. Bit of a no-brainer, but it was useful at the time for justifying broadband. Um, interactive whiteboards seems to, be, seems to be good. Embedded use takes teachers time to learn how to use them in different ways. In primary, no impact in, in secondary. No impact of interactive whiteboards in secondary. Seven to 11 year olds, yes. Secondary learners, no. Um, the um, GCSE outcome stuff, really, really interesting. Actually, just the fact that kids have technology at home and use it, and they don't have to use it for educational purposes, but not using it for games is the critical thing. If they use it for games all the time, they're sunk educationally, to be quite honest. But if they use it for communicating and web searching and general information gathering, even if, it, even if it's nothing to do with their schoolwork, there is a positive impact on, on, on learning outcomes. And that's that the, the um, IFS, Institute of Fiscal Studies, has, has done a proper, you know, um, a, a proper model around that, which has factored out everything else that might be a proxy for um, other, other impacts. Revision online. Well, BBC Bite Size will be happy, and there's other packages, and we looked at some commercial data, in fact. That seems to be useful, because that's kind of tied to being prepared to do an assessment, and that has an impact on assessment outcomes. Um, and then the, the classic, know, know your kids. Schools, know your kids. And if you've got good online information systems for monitoring it, managing, managing learners, and they're embedded in your school, then that's coming up as, as, as a good impact. Just to finish off, we're seeing some, if you like, some, if you like, emerging practices with not heavy impact evidence behind them, but some really good school practices that are emerging. And stuff up there at the top around, for example, um, engaging disengaged learners. And at the bottom, we've got the narrowing the gap study, literature review, just published, which is, is actually coming up with some, what, what are pretty much exemplars, really, if you like, of these are ways that technology these, in a way, these are, these are processes, interactions, that are actually supported and improved by technology, rather than this is about the technology. Um, and, and so some very interesting findings there. It would be great to say we've got some heavy, wonderful impact evidence behind this stuff. We haven't. These are exemplars where there is reasonable good local evidence of impact, but not beyond. Um, 
finally, we're just doing some stuff with um, the University of Nottingham and CERO, um, some of which will be presented um, tomorrow, which is actually looking a bit more at new modes of learning. We know we have a lot more to do around new modes and practices. We're just getting into that territory. Um, and we'll start understanding what, if you like, what, what kind of practices will work and will run um, and will really make a difference in, in school-based settings. Right. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. <laughs> right, we have literally about uh, two minutes for questions, I think, for, or five minutes, possibly, if there are any. Josie. The income, um, yeah. because that one, because um, just from the way you phrased it, it might have just been an accident of the way you phrased it, uh, I got the impression that you were suggesting that the no internet access of 39% was a result of the fact that the income is low, but it clearly isn't because 61% have got the in internet yeah. access, right? Yeah. So, so do you have a sense of what the other, what the next most important factor is in that, that no internet group that's causing? So what are the, what are the factors in whether or not that, yeah. is, that is a choice? It's, it's interesting. I mean, we, income, I think, is probably a proxy for some other things. I yeah. mean, we certainly know that um, kids from single parent families are less likely than kids from where there's, and, and of course, income does play a kind of role there, so it's difficult to separate it out. We know kids from not all, but certain minority ethnic groups are less likely to have it than others. Um, and uh, we know that there are actually, interestingly, there are regional differences, but they're probably socioeconomic group is issues. So for example, Southeast, I mean, basically, the further you get away from the Southeast, on the whole, and it's, it's, it, you know, it's a generalization, then, then the worse the access. Yorkshire and Humberside comes out pretty low, actually. And that's probably to do with, um, I guess, kind of cultural, educational issues. No, I mean, not low as in no one in Yorkshire and Humberside has it, but relatively low. Uh, and it's m probably most likely to reflect, reflect a kind of, obviously, the kind of work-based background of the parents or, or culture um, and the educational mm. stuff so, as well. May, um, just, just a comment. It may not be a very easy problem to solve, and you know, money might not be the answer. Thank you.